Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Glad you could join us for this first Sunday of Advent. Hopefully, you all have your communion cups when you arrive, so you'll need those later in worship. A couple of things to share with you. This Wednesday night begins our Advent Wednesdays, and we will have dinner at 6 o'clock downstairs, and then we're going to talk about traveling with our ancestors, and we're going to talk about biblical ancestors. This week, we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about Jeremiah this week um, and how he influenced the people of Israel. And, you know, Jeremiah died before he saw um, the whole ending of the story. And then we're going to talk about our own ancestors. Uh, so we're going to get to learn about each other's ancestors. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have in my life, um, does anybody else have flowery ancestors that you don't want to necessarily talk about in your life? Good job, honey. Yeah, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Um, I have I have in my life an Uncle Bob, um, my dad's brother, who was just a character. But we'll, we'll talk about how, though, then our ancestors influence us and how we live our lives, either in a good way, and they guide us in a new direction, or we follow in their footsteps, right? It kind of happens in both ways. So that'll be fun. So that'll be Wednesday night at six o'clock. Carly wants me to make some kind of soup I've never made before. Oh, so I don't know, we'll see what the menu looks like um, come Wednesday night. In the back there are Advent boxes. If you'd like to take an Advent box. Um, I forgot to print off the papers, however. But y'all know what to put in there, right? If you don't, see me and if you want a paper, and I'll get you a paper. And we'd like them back um, by December 19th. So I think that's it for this morning. Um, our opening video this morning is called The Wonder of Hope. our hearts for worship as we listen to Jen as she plays for us to pray.
Our hymn this morning is, We Hail You, God's Anointed. Scripture is Psalms chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. 
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been my my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. The prophet said, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, and I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Let the writer of the Psalms teach us. Let us know your ways, guide us to walk in your paths, help us to find the truth, teach us the God of our salvation. And for our meditation, in the spring of 1997, people all over the world were fascinated by the night sky. Even without a telescope or binoculars, the hale bob Comet was brilliant in the northwest sky. It was the most spectacular comet that this generation of people had ever seen. The comet was so bright that even city dwellers, surrounded by lights, were able to see it. In the dark rural countryside, it was awe-inspiring. Generations had waited and waited for the Messiah. When will he come? They wondered. How will we know him? Will there be a sign to let us know he is here? Like the comet in the night sky, the Messiah brings light to people, to us. As we wait during Advent, we have a task. We should live our lives in expectation of a world which we have the opportunity to make light filled. The light of the first Advent candle can remind us through this week of the light, our way of life. Come to us, Lord Jesus, as Advent is here this year, full of expectations and full of hope. Help us to see the ways the promise of being fulfilled. Guide our lives in your ways. Use our waiting for the Christ to know you better, O oh God of Israel. Amen. Now go forth into the world in light. May the Lord make you abound in love for one another and for all. May God strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Advent candle lighting song this year is Hope Waits for Us at Advent, and each week we'll add a verse. The choir is going to sing it through for us first, and then we'll all join in. So Judy, you can put the word
So each week we'll add a verse, and by the time we get to Christmas Eve, you'll all have it figured out, right? Disagree with me, yeah, we'll have it figured out. Prayer concerns are shared with you this morning. Uh, before we pray together, we continue to pray uh, for Dwight and Teresa, um, Paula and Kevin. And Paula finally is doing much better. Um, Kathy told me just a bit ago, and hopefully we'll go back to work after the first of the year. Um, it's been since September that she's been dealing with COVID and then the side effects. And then um, John and Lisa and Mike are grandparents. Alex and Caitlin had a little baby boy on on the 24th, which is which was what, Thursday? Wednesday. Wednesday. And his name is Jaden Michael. And so um, one of three to come very quickly. So we're um, thrilled and give thanks to God for that. Okay, Gina. Oh, I jumped ahead, didn't I? We're going to pray anyway. Okay? And then we'll just we'll just skip the prayer video, Gina. Skip ahead to the prayer confession when we get there. And then we'll come back to Scripture. Gina will have to use her, her uh, PowerPoint skills back there. I invite you to pray with me. God, we are full of hope this day. Hope reminds us that even in a world of darkness... Even in a world where chaos can seem to abound. Even in a world where it seems that the losses are greater than the gains. Even in a world where grief sometimes overtakes us. We come having the audacity because of your word to hope. To hope for a better future. To hope that your incarnation into the world to the Christ child will once again have the ability to change the world. Make the world a different place. We have the hope that we'll see eye to eye yet again. And the peace will break out in all places. Oh God, because of this candle this day, hope is alive in us, in our church, in our community, in our world. May it be so for us, God, that hope would abound and live in us and be a part of who we are as we live our lives. Oh God, it's because of hope that we pray. It's because of hope that we come to you. We hope for healing. We hope for reconciliation. We hope and give thanks for the gift of new life. We hope for what comes on the other side of immense grief. We hope, God, that you be present with us in all of our lives. For Dwight, Teresa, Paula, and Kevin, we pray for your mercy and grace be present in their lives that hope might abound. For Alex and Caitlin and Jaden, we give you thanks. And pray, God, for the hope and the gift of new life. For many others, God, who need to know of your healing, of your grace, and of your mercy. And others who just need that small flicker of hope in their lives. We pray. We offer ourselves to you this day. We give you thanks, God, for all things. For your abundant grace among us and through us. And now hear us, God, as we pray together our prayer of confession. Loving Creator, you call us to rejoice in your promise of the birth that is to come. 
but we are afraid. You invite us into a world where justice and righteousness prevail, but we turn away in fear. We long for an easy path into your promised world, but you warn us that there is no easy way. Birth new life within us, that we may abide in your perfect love, the love that casts out fear. Amen. So our prayer song for the season of Advent is Make of My Heart a Savior. Um, Mr. Weston, who's sitting back there saying Paul a hundred times over, he's getting tubes in his ears on Tuesday morning. He's been sick and then sick again and then sick again with all this fun stuff. So hopefully after Tuesday morning, um, that will make him feel better. But he'll feel better because tomorrow he's spending the whole day with Paul. Paul so he's got to feel better, right? Right, Dar? Right, okay. So, so I'm sorry, Rod, for just jumping right ahead, but we'll have the scripture now. I thought I had all the changes written down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can throw you curveballs. Today's scripture comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for, for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 9 through 13 we hear these words. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all just as we abound in love for you. And may he do so, strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. recognize our choir anthem. It's pretty familiar to you all, and so um, we're happy to be singing again with you and for you and uh, encouraging our
The Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper in the story of Jesus' birth. But this popular notion is alive in our imaginations. Sometimes the innkeeper gets a bad rap, and if providing as if providing substandard accommodations for a family about to go through the birthing process. But what if we saw the innkeeper as someone who, with a full house, thought literally outside the box to solve the problem? What if we endeavor to do the same to provide ministry to house the holy in ways we have not yet imagined? This Advent season, we will offer some stories to stir our imagination and stoke the possibilities for our own hospitality. So we've transitioned to the season of Advent, and I've thrown everybody some curveballs. So maybe next week the curveballs will curve a little less, maybe. So we hear this morning, we make this transition in this season of Advent. And we transition from the Gospel of Mark, as we've been talking about, to the Gospel of Luke. And Luke is this great storyteller, and we're going to hear all the stories of Christmas and the Advent season from the writer of the Gospel of Luke, but this morning we hear a little bit different text as we begin our time together as we talk about hope. Jesus says this, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the leaves. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close upon you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may stand able before the Son of Man. I invite you to pray with me. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we begin our Advent season with this idea, this concept, this thinking, this, this ray, if you will, of hope. And we light the first candle. And we light one candle, this candle of hope. And it seems to me when we light one candle in this season of Advent and then we add to them, but this first one, this candle of hope, it reminds me that we have the audacity to light one candle and that this hope will somehow light the entire world and that hope, hope, will make a difference. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to watch a couple of shows on TV. Um, do you all know the show um, Counts Custom Cars? Has anybody watched that show? You like that show, Devin? There are a couple others. Um, there's a, a show called, I'm not going to say the, well, it's called Bitchin Rides. Have you ever watched that show before? And there's a, there's a couple other, Restoration Garage. Has anybody watched any of those shows? Russ, you like, do you like those shows? They're, it's pretty fast. I've said to Diane, what happens is on these shows is that sometimes people have these cars brought into these shops and they are less than desirable. Would that be true, Russ? Some of them are in really bad shape. Some of those cars, when they come in on the back of a flatbed and they arrive in this shop, some of those cars have lost their hope. They're a disaster. But it's amazing what happens. Often the owner comes and, and they talk through the entire process and man, sometimes those cars to get restored are 30, 40, $50,000, if not more to have these cars restored. I've told Diane more than once, I watch these shows and I marvel at them because the people who work in these shops, they are incredible. They can cut out pieces and put pieces back in. They can tear apart engines and make them work. They put in new headliners. They do brand new upholstery. I watch those shows and I'm just amazed I'm amazed at their talents. I'm also a little bit shocked and disappointed that I have zero talents in life. You know the one talent I have in life? This is it. I'm doing it, this is it. I, you know, people who pull over on the side of the road, their car breaks down and they raise their hood. Y'all do that if your car breaks down, get out around the front, raise your hood. Yeah, no, me neither. I can race the hood of my car. <laughs> it means nothing to me. It drives Dustin crazy. The last new car we bought, Dustin said, Dad, what's it look like under the hood? I'm like, but I don't, I don't know what it looks like under the hood. He's like, you didn't look under the hood? I'm like, no, I didn't look under the hood. It means nothing to me. It's brand new. It has a warranty. And when you raise the hood, do you know what, it, what you see when you raise the hood? Plastic. Yeah, plastic and hoses. The only good thing it says under the hood of my car is Ford. Oh, I knew that would get some reaction. Some of these cars, though, are just, the owners of these shops say, we can't do that. But the owners of the car say, I want them restored. And in the end, through the magic of television, they drive these cars away. Sometimes in the midst of our lives, hope, hope seems far off. It, it seems desperate, doesn't it? That we just can't find hope in our world. I mean, we look at our world and look at all the chaos that ensues in our world and hope, hope seems beyond our grasp, doesn't it? 
Now there's a new variant. Did y'all hear that? There's a new variant. It's, it's, it's hard to find hope. In Luke's gospel, we hear Jesus talk about things changing in the world, about the weather changing, about these cosmic signs, these strange portents in the world that point us to an end. And Jesus says to look up to the sky and you'll see all these changes coming. This roaring of the sea, this warning of wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and floods and all of these things, we're struck by what that must mean for us. It feels like it's only negative, life-changing, frightening news. But I'm convinced. I'm convinced that in the season of Advent, when we light the Advent candle, Pat Brown said it earlier this morning when we were in the fireside room. She made this really valid point that I hadn't gotten that far yet. She said, we we're talking about lighting the one candle and then we add to it. And then Pat said, not long from now, all of us will be holding the candle. We go from one candle of hope to dispel the darkness to five candles to a hundred or more candles. And everyone holding them up, we have the audacity to know that in the midst of the world that seems hopeless, Jesus reminds us that something new is breaking upon us in this season of Advent. Something new is about to happen to us. And maybe just maybe what needs to happen to you and what needs to happen to me really is about hope. I'm around enough people as you are to know that hope sometimes seems untamed. Sometimes hope seems unattainable. And even when we think it's within our grasp, every time we reach for it, it scoots a little farther away. And we just can't quite grasp it. But Jesus, Jesus reminds us some, about something more in this text than about disaster and the end of the world. When these things happen to you, Jesus says, stand up and lift up your head because redemption, redemption is drawing near. The challenge for us, I believe in this season of Advent, the challenge for us as we light a candle every week, the challenge for us as we grasp for hope, the challenge for us is to make room. Sometimes I think my life is like one of those beat up cars that comes into the shop. And the owner looks at it and looks at me and shakes his head and says, Jim, do you know what it's going to take? You know what's going to take to make this whole again? But then I remember, I remember growing up as a kid in church and lighting the Advent candle. I remember going to church on Christmas Eve, as Pat said, and all of us holding the candles. In the midst of that place in the church I grew up in, really no different than any other church. I was reminded that we have to make room. Rod mentioned it in the light of the Advent candle, or maybe it was for the offering. There's no 
There's no real innkeeper in the story. We, we make that up. We kind of like to add that. Then we like to sing the song. Right? Do y'all know the song? Knock, knock, knock when Joseph. Do y'all know that song? Oh, you're, boy, you're all missing out in life. Tracy, you know that song yet? Huh. Knock, knock, knock when Joseph on the innkeeper's door that night. Now I'm going to lose the words. Can you a shelter a family for the Christ child is born tonight? No room, no room, said the man in Bethlehem. No room, no room, said the man in Bethlehem. No. Does it ring a bell with anybody? Oh. You see, we have to make room in our lives, right? I think for hope, for hope to become part of who we are, we have to make room, we have to open the door, we have to allow ourselves to be changed. You see, I think Jesus reminds us in this text that for something new to come, for something new to happen in our lives, for the incarnation to take place in the world and in our lives, something has to go away. And it's up to us. It's incumbent on you. It's incumbent on me to make room in our lives for hope, to look for hope, to find hope in the midst of despair, to know that hope isn't beyond our grasp, and to know that today in this place we've had the audacity to light one candle and to know that this one candle of hope can light the world and change it and make it better. And even make our lives better. Oh, I don't know. We, we look around at all of us and it's easy to say, it's easy to say that we're going to hell in a handbasket, isn't it? It's easy to say that. I don't believe that to be the case at all. What I believe is this God who comes to us in Jesus is calling us to hope. It's calling us to make room. It's calling us to look at life in a different way. It's calling us to make room for hope in our lives. And if we do, if we do, I, I think the world can be a better in different place. There is, there is a poem I want to share with you to end, written in 1919 or 1920 by T.S. Eliot. It's called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Does anybody know that poem? You're going to know it now. Hear what he has to say about the world. Let's go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table, let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights, in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make a visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow frog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. 
And indeed there will be a time from the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back on the window panes, there will be a time, there will be a time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be a time to murder and create, a time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room where women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be a time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how is hair is growing thin? My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, by asserting a simple pen, do I dare to stoop the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them already, known them all. Having known the evenings, mornings, and afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with the dying fall. Beneath the music from a further room, so how should I presume? And I know the eyes already, knowing them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pen, when I am pinned and wiggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my ways? How should I presume? And I have known the arms already, knowing them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare. Arms that lie along a table wrapped about a shawl. And should I then presume, and how should I begin? I have seen them riding the seward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea. By sea girls read with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. T.S. Eliot reminds us that in all of life, as it goes, hope, hope is what grounds us. Hope is what abounds in our lives. Amen. Okay, Gina. The Holy One be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to our God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us our grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. For we have and We come to this table. The God who burned us, the God who, who gives us hope, the God who calls us to make room. It's the God who calls us to share in the bread and the cup. We haven't understood, nor will we ever always understand what God has done for us. Yet God's love remains steadfast. In the midst of oppression, and despair. We gather around the table. We're aware of Jesus that night, gathered, seated with those friends. They wanted to make this final distinct impression on their lives. You'll remember the story. We celebrate this, but before all of this happened, what did Jesus do for the disciples? He washed their feet. He washed their feet. It was an act of service. He washed their feet. Jesus.
Jesus so wanted to change their lives and I believe get them, give them something to hold on to that he took the bread and the cup and he just offered it to them as we are offered the bread and the cup this day. I invite you to pray with me. For out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here among these gifts of bread and wine, open our hearts in and through this act, stripping away any excuse or fearful hesitation so that we will open our doors to the world as the body of Christ, redeemed by his love. Amen. So it was this gift of bread that Jesus took, and he took it and he gave thanks to God for all of God's blessings, and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat of this, all of you. Remember me and be thankful. And after supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks to God, and he poured it out. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's poured out for your sins and the sins of many. As often as you drink of this, remember me and be thankful. The disciples took it, and they drank, and they remembered. Friends, this table, this bread, and this cup, they're our gift this day. They help us in the midst of our lives, to find hope. And it might not be hope that we find in this exact moment when we take and drink it. It might not be this afternoon. It might not be next week or even next month. But I know that gathering around this table and the sharing of this meal goes deep inside of us. And somewhere, Sometime, in some place, we'll find it. And hope will abound. If you'll get the top of your cup open, if you need help, if you need someone to help you and find your wafer there. Friends, this is the body of Christ. It's broken for us this day. Take it either of this, all of you. Remember Christ and be thankful. Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's poured out for your sins and the sins of me. Drink of this, all of you. Remember Christ and be thankful. I invite you to join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I close him this morning by the same as seeing as a little town of Bethlehem.
know, there are some Sunday mornings when I stand up here and think, boy, what a disaster that was. <laughs> and today's one of those days. <clears throat> but I just want to say this to you. Come, come back next week. It'll be better. I promise. So may God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. May the Holy Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you, may it be so for us, and may it be so for this church. Amen. Now I invite you to pray with me our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now you can be seated as we listen to Jen as she plays for us the postlude. 